Today, uh, our show's topic is the cold start doctrine. And uh, you being a defense analyst, uh, you being uh, a retired colonel from the Pakistan Army, uh, let's discuss uh, today's topic, the cold start doctrine. And, uh, you know, I have some questions on my mind sure. that I'd like to discuss. Um, why did India devise a military doctrine to fight a limited conventional war against Pakistan under the nuclear umbrella, Colonel Saab? Actually, this thing started in 1994 when General Sundarji was the Indian chief of the army. And then it has evolved. It has got three objectives. First is this, that India's strike corps, they have their peacetime locations deep inside the country and they take about three to four weeks to mobilize and deploy on the borders if the war comes. Pakistan has got an advantage because most of our major cantonments are near the border and our uh, deployment time is uh, two to three days in fact. Second reason is this, that India wanted a doctrine to carry out punitive, quick, fast, punitive surgical strikes against Pakistan against any subconventional threat. That is from the non-state actors or terrorists as uh, India keeps on uh, alleging Pakistan has got terrorist bases and all that. And the third reason is this, that since 1998, both the countries are nuclear powers now. And they have drawn a false anal analogy, I'll come to that later, which was between uh, the Soviet Union and the Americans, the two superpowers, right up to 1990. And they thought under the nuclear umbrella, there's a threshold, there's a space for limited war. But that is wrong. Let me explain. Now, Americans and Soviet Union, they had a term they were using, MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction during the Cold War, right from 1945 to 1990. Now, both had second strike capability. Now, that paradigm cannot be applied to India and Pakistan in the South Asia. Why? Firstly, they were continents away. And at that time, the, minim the maximum reaction time was 30 minutes warning time. For example, if the Russians, they launched a nuclear attack or the Americans did that, each of the country would have at least 30 minutes to react, to go into safety mode, to go in a defensive mode or to launch a counter strike. Now, as far as India and Pakistan are concerned, our borders are geographically contiguous. If India or Pakistan attack, till the time the impact takes place, None of the country would know whether it's a conventional strike or a nuclear strike because the maximum time, the maximum window to react is three minutes. Now, you're not going to wait if your radars or your early warning system detects a missile launch from India. You're not going to wait for it to impact to find out whether it's a nuclear missile or it's a conventional missile. So you've got to launch. So that uh, uh, creates an instability in the relationship. Third point is this, whether India attacks or Pakistan attacks, are most of our major cities, especially in Pakistan's case, are on the border area. For example, you carry a nuclear strike on India, the fallout could come to you also if the wind changes the direction. Same thing for India. So that's a false analogy. And fourth point in this is that America and Soviet Union fought limited wars, proxy wars, without engaging their own forces in different parts of Asia like Vietnam, Korea, Angola, Mozambique and different other places also. They never came into contact directly. So they had that space. We do not have that space. Uh, okay, Colonel, uh, is it effective enough to neutralize or at least uh, severely degrade uh, the, military, uh, the military capabilities of the, the Pakistani forces? Well, uh, Zain, we have got a very strong conventional defense. We have always been maintaining a ratio with the Indian force structure. So, that is not a point to be scared of. But the second point is this, as far as cold star doctrine is concerned, it is not very effective. Why? I'll tell you. Now, if you develop any doctrine, it has got one, two, three phases. First, the conceptual phase. Second, experimentation. Third is implementation. Conceptually, India has been talking about it, like I told you earlier, since 1984. It has been evolving. They've been talking. They have also been experimenting, especially after 2004, after the attack on the parliament in 2001. From 2004 till now, they have got about five, six major exercises where they have been experimenting. 
As far as the implementing stage is concerned, India is nowhere towards their desired objective. Why? They do not have a proper infrastructure. They do not have proper cantonments near the border areas. Although they have got the cantonments for the holding course, but not for the strike core. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the equipment. Now, if you cast an eye on the whole Indian Army, more than uh, 1.2, 1.3 million, only 35% of that army has got a mobility within India itself. They need self-propelled artillery guns to support this doctrine. And they've got only 10% of those guns which they require. 10%? Only 10%. Their uh, tanks, they are outdated. Although they did buy some new uh, T-90 tanks from Russia, but most of their tanks are outdated and their own indigenous tank is still not in the final stages of protection. Thirdly, India has always been having a defensive a doctrine. Now, if you are going towards an offensive doctrine, you need a change of mindset. Indian Army military is very conservative. So they will need a lot of time to train their uh, people, train their officers especially, to think in terms of mobility and flexibility. And let me add one more thing. This doctrine does not have the validity from their political leadership. And I might even uh, refer you to one of their American ambassadors in 2004-2005 in, 2004, 2005 in uh, USA, uh, USA's ambassador in India. He sent a cable to his State Department. He says it's just a mixture of myth and reality. And I would say it's more of a myth than reality. Uh, Colonel, oh, what would be the role of air power in such a conflict? In this conflict, air power has a very crucial role. As far as the Indians are concerned, I'm talking about their concept on the, because like I've told you, there is no implementation so far on the horizon. So as far as Indians are concerned, since they're going to use armored columns, mechanized uh, columns, self propelled artillery, they would need air cover, right? As far as the role is concerned, now, there's a new concept, no, not new now, but the concept which came out after the first Persian Gulf War in 1991. That is the air land battle. Earlier on, air had two major roles, to create air superiority in the area of operations and second close support to the ground forces. Air land battle envisages a broader role for that, that you start hitting the enemy in the rear areas, their infrastructure, armament factories, depots, railroads, and those reserve forces which have yet to move out to the battle to start striking them so that you create chaos even behind the enemy which is at the front line. So that is known as air land battle which is a very close uh, integration of land and air warfare. And one example was in Yugoslavia. In Yugoslavia for the first uh, in the 90s for the first two weeks, it was only an air battle. The American ground troops did not go in, and they devastated the economy and the infrastructure and the forces of Yugoslavia. Second was, if you remember, uh, again referring back to the first Gulf War, there was a 24-hour air battle, which devastated Saddam's forces. Its uh, allied Republican Guard was totally decimated. So secondly, in this, from Pakistani point of view, we have got uh, superior aircrafts like uh, GF-17, Thunder. We, we, just, uh, we just got it. We have got Mirages, we have got F-16s, and we keep on upgrading them. And the third uh, factor which the air can help us will be early warning system, reconnaissance, surveillance, and all that. So air is going to have a very, very crucial role in any future battle. Okay, uh, what does India consider a provocation uh, to launch cold start on Pakistan since it's a loose term? Well, India's stated uh, threshold is that if there's a terrorist attack from Pakistani side, terrorists coming from Pakistan, having the basis, alleged basis in Pakistan, like they did on the Indian parliament in December 2001, and a few months before that on the Indian held Kashmir parliament, and then, of course, we have got this uh, 2008 attack in Bombay, where uh, India accuses Pakistan of sending a terrorist. And they accuse. They oh. accuse us. So, and they have stated that next time they have got such a pro such a attack, 
that would provoke them to launch gold star. But like I said earlier to your earlier question, they do not have the wherewithal, they do not have the capacity to do that. Had it been there, they would have done it in 2008. Okay, Colonel, uh, this is uh, one of my favorite questions. Uh, does Pakistan intend to stall the Indian forces right at uh, the border itself or fight a tactical uh, retreat till the Indian forces lose momentum? Well, the short answer is this, that due to our geography, we do not have a choice. We need to stop Indians cold in the track right at the border. Let me explain. Till about uh, mid-80s, We've been having a very defensive posture as far as the borders are concerned. From mid-80 onwards, we have gone on an offensive defense. There is a doctrine which states that we may need to carry out preemptive strikes in the Indian area to obviate their attack. Now, as far as Pakistan is concerned, I wish we had a map here. Pakistan is basically triangular in shape with a long border line on the eastern border with India. And all our major population centers, like Sialkot, Lahore, they are right next to the border. Now, Lahore is only 20 kilometers. Even if you go to the south, Karachi is 160 kilometers, which is nothing uh, in terms of modern warfare. All our uh, transportation networks, they run parallel to the border. Our line of communication runs parallel to the border. Our industrial areas are near to the border. That means our economic or war fighting capability is also near to the border. In fact, uh, our average depth, geographical depth is just about 300 kilometers. And we have got a very big disadvantage near Ringyar Khan area where our waste is very, very narrow. And India has got eyes on that in a total war, in an all-out war, that they want to hit that area. That is the most crucial, most vulnerable place they would likely divide Pakistan into two portions. So we have no choice. We either preempt if we get an, get an early warning, like I was talking about you, the concept of land air warfare, we go into the airstrikes and stop them in there. Otherwise, we have got very strong defenses on the border. So we are likely to stop them at the border. But having said that, in uh, battle and sometimes by design, there is always a chance of some sort of penetration. Because if the, where the enemy attacks you, there the ratio of the attacking forces is much more, the tactical ratio is much more than the defenders. So the conventional military science says it's got to be ratio of 3 to 1 if you're attacking and maybe more at times. So there is a likelihood of some sort of penetration, maybe 5 miles, 10 miles, 15 miles. And at times it is by design that you want to suck in the enemy. But in a conventional sense, we cannot afford to suck in the enemy. Um, I wanted to ask you, oh, what is the role of uh, C4ISR relating to uh, the Cold Star Doctrine? Well, then in modern battlefield, C4ISR is very crucial. Now, let me explain. C4 means command, control, communication, and computers. I means intelligence, SR is, S is surveillance, and R is reconnaissance. Now, this is a very important for military leaders. They need to have real-time intelligence, real-time information, and more importantly, they need to have data links, video links, so they can communicate and they can confer in real time. In earlier days, Second World War, or uh, even after that, commanders had to travel down or up to confer, they had to be physically at the same place or use telephone, which was not very reliable. But we had seen in uh, the Americans war in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, they've been talking, consulting on video links right from Kabul to Washington or from Baghdad to Washington. So this is a, of a very crucial element. In fact, now we need uh, to have net centric armies. That means all the components of the army, all the components of a division or a corps or any unit, they are able to communicate with each other, share intelligence, share information, share decisions in a very rapid mode. And as far as we are concerned, uh, we have got a uh, lot of hardware for this. We have got uh, SAB early warning uh, aircrafts with the uh, state of art aircraft with the PF. And they can give you a real time picture of the battlefield. Then we have got radars, look up, look down radars, 
long range radars short range radars ground radars we have got uavs also that is uh, which is commonly known as drone pf uh, is having two squadrons of uavs that is uh, unmanned aerial vehicle commonly known as drone and they are going to have uh, ultimately six squadrons of that so we have got the air vehicles and uh, we are pretty fine in that aspect in the presence of strategic balance in South Asia, why do the Indians still have a feeling that a limited war with Pakistan is still possible? Well, I partially answered uh, this question earlier that Indians are drawing a wrong analogy from the paradigm between the erstwhile USSR and the Americans during Cold War. They had a space. They could fight proxy wars. They could fight limited wars. No. Let me also explain here for our viewers what is a limited war. Limited war's concept dates back to the 18th century and it was applied uh, during our 20th century also. Limited war means limited political objectives or multi objectives, fought in a limited designated geographical area, use of limited weapon systems. So, Americans and Russians, like I said earlier, they could not afford a nuclear war. But they had their interest, they had to safeguard their interest. They were both hegemonistic powers, they had different camps, clashing ideologies, so they had to fight a war. They were using proxies. They were using countries in Asia, they were using countries in Africa and elsewhere. Now, India has drawn a very strong analogy from there. We, as far as Pakistan is concerned, we do not have, I repeat, we do not have any space between a conventional war and a nuclear war. There is no space for a limited war. Now, I'll just give you one example of the Kargil War. Without going to the merits and demerits of Kargil War, not withstanding other factors, other aspects, during Kargil War, India, well, it was a limited war for Pakistan side, but India escalated it conventionally though, by massing their uh, heavy guns, which were not expected from the Pakistani planners. But since we could not afford that escalation, we had already deployed our nuclear missiles before the Prime Minister of Pakistan went in and conferred and uh, talked to the American President for a ceasefire, to arrange a ceasefire. So, like I said, we have just one rung on the strategic ladder to go nuclear. India attacks us in the force, we have to go nuclear. There is no other reason, there is no other uh, option for us. Now, let me also uh, tell you one thing related since you have asked this question. Okay, when would Pakistan escalate from a connection to nuclear war? First thing I said, if there's a massive attack, because like I said earlier, we cannot afford any Indian penetration beyond our borders. Pakistan already declared a few years back that if a major chunk of its territory is occupied by the Indians, or if a major portion of their military has been destroyed, or there is an economic chokehold, that is economic blockade of Karachi, or India instigates some massive instability by using internal subversion, then we go nuclear. But that was for strategic nuclear weapons. But as far as Cold Star, uh, Cold Star is concerned, we will go nuclear. We have got battlefield nuclear weapons to get over that. Uh, would you elaborate on the battlefield uh, nuclear? Uh... Yeah. Since India is going, India is going to have a superiority of five is to one or six is to one ratio where they attack on our borders, even using their uh, their cold uh, cold star doctrine. That also envisages uh, dispersion on eight to nine axes across Pakistan's border. We do not, we like I said, we do have a strong national defense but we cannot allow any penetration. So, what we are going to do is, we have called, we have developed Hadaf 9, known as Nasser also. It's a low yield nuclear weapon, having a 60 kilometer range, and it's a 300 millimeters weapon, that is about 12 inches. And we have used uh, Chinese multi-barrel rocket launcher, uh, having four tubes, that is known as probably A-100. We are going to use that. And interestingly, it's a shoot and scoot weapon. You fire and you move. 